I'd like to call the meeting to order. Would everyone please stand to join us for the flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right. Welcome, everybody. We'll start out on a report about our from our closed session. Um, item C two uh, A was public employee uh, government code section five four nine five seven title superintendent. Information was exchanged. No action was taken. Pen. Um, <laughs> item uh, C two B. Uh, conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation government code section 54956.9b number of cases one information was exchanged no action was taken okay so we'll move on to the approval of minutes I'll move for approval of the minutes second any discussion all in favor aye, aye. Okay, move on to uh, item C4, approval of the agenda and consent agenda. So moved. Second. Roll call. Alicia. Aye. Jacqueline. Aye. Andy. Aye. Terry. Aye. And I'm Mike. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to uh, public interest reports presentations. And our first item is a presentation of the uh, CEF school grants and I thought I saw Mr. Patine out there somewhere you're up first there good we have oh, representatives no, from the Carpent Carpinteria Education Foundation with us um, hi everybody hear me oh. I'm Tyler Powell I'm the president of Carp Education Foundation Here, do you want to hold this? I will. <laughs> Never seen a check that big or held one. Um, <laughs> I'm Tyler Powell. I'm the president of Carpentry Education Foundation, and it's with great honor to present this check for $41,000 to the um, all the schools in the Carp School District. Uh, the money's been allocated per the grants written by the principals at each of the schools, and we just want to thank everybody who's part of the community and who made it all happen at Carp and Cabana, our big fundraiser and all the donors and sponsors and anyone who helped volunteer and help make it happen. It's really a great honor and uh, really want to thank Deborah. She's our executive director. I want to thank all the board members um, of CEF. It's, it's a great event. We're happy to do this for all the schools and uh, we think it's a really big number and a good number. So thank you. Congratulations. Well, thank, thank you. you. That's fantastic. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we, get a, uh, we get a picture up here in front? Yeah. yeah. Great. We have all of our principals here as well so that they can the pick up yeah. checks for each of their programs. Let's get all the principals. Um, Just stand up behind me. Well, we usually tower. All right, at least I tower. Good. We peek over, you guys. <laughs> we just peek. Make room for me. I'm going to peek through the shoulders. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. That's okay. That's okay. We All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have spots now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. That was. It's always fantastic to to see what the CEF can do for us. Um, we'll move on to item E two, superintendent's report. Great. Hello, board. Since we last met, the district's been busy on a number of fronts. Let me give you a quick rundown. We've concluded orientations for school board candidates on our student population, district staffing, and current budget. And, of course, we'll provide them any other information they'd like about the district. 
Our elementary grade level chairs continue to work with elementary teachers, particularly on the delivery of our new math program. We've been meeting with county career tech and ROP leaders to review our ROP classes and career pathway courses, including such areas as virtual enterprise, computer graphics, culinary arts, and potentially engineering and design, exploring job shadowing, uh, here possibilities here in the community, and pursuing a new career tech grant. Our science leadership team, headed by science uh, teacher Kim Castagna, is currently assessing what we're teaching in science, particularly at the elementary level. The district dual language advisory committee has been meeting and will continue working on our dual language plan after the election when the results of Prop 58 are known, since the proposition deals with English proficiency and multilingual education. The board should expect a report in January. Our work on evaluating extended transitional kindergarten has begun. The board should expect a report also in January. Both issues, dual language and extended TK, are important now because we need to have our options identified by the time we start kindergarten enrollment in early March. We have targeted Monday, March 6th as the start of our kindergarten enrollment process. Other work, special education conducted a training on facilitating IEP meetings with round two scheduled for next month. Our gate coordinator, Teresa Kuntz, conducted a number of gate advanced learner parent night orientations for parents of students, including those who are new to the program. We recently met in a town hall meeting with the Carpinteria Family School community to discuss how to proceed on recommendations surfaced in the investigation report we brought to the board last month. Thank you, particularly board members Michelle Robinson and Andy Schaefer for participating. Just to be clear, some members of the public may not know that we have to be careful about having more than two board members participating in discussions about policy or issues at any one time as we're committed to doing our business at board meetings in, in the public eye. And of course, the entire board can attend public gatherings, uh, but they know they cannot discuss policy issues with any more than one other board member outside of a board meeting, otherwise it becomes an official board meeting. Others. We are moving ahead on our Measure U projects and priorities as directed by the board last month. We will bring the board another update in November, probably the last meeting in November, and it will include a plan to ensure that the Measure U Summerlin rebuild can be completed giving the new cost estimates. You'll recall those were preliminary cost estimates that we were working with at the time. The board will also receive updates in the future on preliminary Measure U project timelines. Finally, we're distributing flyers on Halloween safety tips, and we're moving ahead on a simple and secure sign-in procedure for visitors at our schools. Now for some of the schools. Canalino School, the kindergarten teachers at Canalino, and in fact district-wide, have been completing the district um, kindergarten student entrance profile for each of their students, nearly 100 in total just at Canalino. Using this data as our initial filter, the team has identified students who demonstrate the need for additional support through the academic support system with reading inspiration teaching staff and social and emotional tiered support with the school-based counselor and start therapist in conjunction, conjunction, actually coordination by the school psychologist. The school uses the kindergarten initial assessment to determine who needs help and on which skills they need help with in such areas as letter recognition, rhyming words, and recognizing numbers. Students began receiving additional support this week, either during the school day or added to the end of the school day for additional learning time. Carpinteria Family School, in the spirit of Avocado Festival, K-1 and 2-3 classrooms hung their avocado-inspired artwork called Art Vicados in the Artwork Gallery at Nut Belly Restaurant for the public to view. The school family community and all of the school district is celebrating their very own Amy Porter, the K-1 teacher who is being recognized as one of the top new administrators in our county. On November 5, 
The Santa Barbara County Education Office will be hosting a Salute to Teachers program at the Libero Theater to honor a number of teachers, including Amy, as a distinguished new educator. Congratulations, Ms. Porter. And we'll bring her to a board meeting after that so that you can heap praise on her as well. Middle School. At CMS, teachers and administrators are meeting in grade-level teams and departments to make sure students are engaged and interacting. The goal is to focus on academic vocabulary to increase comprehension at every level. And, of course, a focus on engagement and interaction of students is also part of what we look for in the teacher evaluation process. CHS, Carpinteria High School, is working with Price Waterhouse to implement financial literacy units into the curriculum. This is an area that schools have needed for a long, long time. And, you know, it's not in the, the state curriculum expectations. Ms. Shamblin and Ms. Bryant will be trained in December on the curriculum. Financial literacy units will be embedded into each grade level. Units include financial. Now, you know, this would be good for some adults too, but we'll run all of our high school students through it. Financial responsibility, managing credit, savings and investments, and taxes. The first units will be presented to our students as early as January 2017. So that's coming right up. Thank you, Price Waterhouse. Rincon and Foothill High Schools. Counselors from Santa Barbara City College visited Rincon High School and met with our seniors to introduce them to the enrollment process. Seniors then took a field trip to SBCC and toured the campus with these counselors. The tour included behind the scenes access to the career technical ed programs at City College. And that's a brief rundown for tonight. <coughs> Delphina is up thanks, next. Thanks, Brian. All right. Welcome, Delphina. Hi, everyone. Um, so last week, Carpinteria High School had an exciting week. Sam Truax was named Mr. Warrior, and Jennifer Sanchez Maya was named Homecoming Queen. The dance on Saturday, October 22nd, was a success, and over 240 students attended the dance. College application workshops will be held in the month of November. Please check the website, Parent Square, or the Daily Bulletin for updated information. Carpinteria High School will host Arrive Alive interactive driving experience for our 11th and 12th grade students. The simulation has two options. Students can simulate drunk driving or texting while driving. The event to highlight the importance of safe and responsible driving. This event is being held thanks to the financial support from Cottage Health on November 10th. November 4th will be our second first Friday of the month during extended learning. The activities will be posted next week and students will be able to sign up for them as early as Monday. The administration will be bar barbecuing chicken, hamburgers, and veggie burgers for lunch on the same day. Please check Parent Square for a list of winter sports evaluations. Students wishing to come out for a winter sport must be cleared by the athletic office. Boys and girls soccer, boys and girls basketball, and girls water polo are the winter sports that are open to any student. Please see the athletic office for more information. And that concludes the report for tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to E4, a report on progress of students who are English learners and reclassification rates. When I came into the district, the first call I got was from the county ed office. It was Susan Salcedo, and she said, congratulations, I hear you're going to Carpinteria, and have you looked at the progress for English learners in Carpinteria? She said they're above most other districts in the county, she said, your reclassification rates look good. And, of course, the board has wanted to report on this. Uh, we've asked Bob Keating to, uh, to present this information to you. Bob does a pretty nice job of, uh, of taking a look at the state test results, taking a look at the annual measurable objectives, and, uh, and reviewing how our students are doing. Bob, I'll get out of your way here. See, I've, I've forgotten already how to do that. <laughs> it's nice to see you, Bob. Yeah, it's good to be good to be back and go over the information. As you know, I love numbers, and so when uh, Dr. Sarvis asked me to do this, I said, sure, we can do that. So 
So what we're going to be looking at is basically EL progress from last year, the last two years. And, and it's going to be an overall view. We can go into great detail, but I know I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in the minutia. So I'm going to try not to, if that's possible. All right, so let's begin with enrollment numbers because those are the, the driving force behind looking at these kids. We want to take a look at the percentage of students being cla uh, classified as English learners. We want to know how this compares to previous years. And so if we take a look, one of the things that's, I, that's right, I can't use this. I've got to use this. There we go. Notice how flat the line is. Mm -hmm. So there really hasn't been a tremendous increase. In fact, there's a slight decrease. In talk, talking to Principal Pursun, she indicated that this might be the reason for this is we had an increase in the number of uh, non-Latino kids or white kids uh, last year, which could reduce not the number of, of limited English speakers, but the percentage. So once again, the other thing that we've seen over the years is we do not have a lot of new English learners coming in after kindergarten. So the majority of our kindergarten, our English learners start in kindergarten and stay all the way through the system. I would also like to just note that in 2010 is when the Carpinteria Children's Project started and there was an increase in preschool. Right. So that correlates with mm -hmm. the number of ELs that went Perfect. down. Good. So. Mm -hmm. All right, now <clears throat> what kind of services are we providing? If you look at the, uh, I'm going to say it because I get, I get very frustrated when I'm sitting in a meeting and I hear all these acronyms. So the LCAP or the Local Control and Accountability Plan. In the, the LCAP, we have outlined what we're going to be doing for our English learners, and also we have a, what we call Title III Plan. Both are available on the, the uh, district website, so anyone can take a look at it and, and get more details. I've just put some of the basics on here. Number one, the most important thing that we can do is provide English language development instruction. This means teaching English as a second language. It doesn't mean just giving kids a, a barrage of English. So one of the things that the state requires is that we provide at least 45 minutes of ELD each day, which we're doing. Second, English learners need to be in classrooms and receiving lessons that have what we call English language development embedded in the le lesson. A lot of people call it sheltered English or SADAI specially designed academic instruction in English, but it's, it's how the, the students are able to have access and learn what's being taught. This includes such things as previewing vocabulary words, setting up sentence structures where you leave out certain words, and then the kid would put in the new vocabulary word and learn how to, the words, but also how to use them in a sentence. Very, very important. We learned a lot of this through our Kate Casella ELD training we had a couple of years ago. And lastly, uh, ELD students need to have specific interventions to increase their English language ability and their academic ability in many cases. So this is, these are the things that we are currently doing to, to increase the performance of, a, of our English learners. We've got, we've over the last couple of years purchased some specific programs to use with English learners. The first one you see is Read 180, which is a reading program designed for struggling readers. Uh, this would be the, the high-end reading intervention program. We also have System 44, which is a little bit lower. English 3D, which is used at the middle school for teaching English as a second language. And Academic Toolkit, which we just purchased last year from Kate Casella, which provides elementary teachers with some specific activities they can do to improve vocabulary development. Uh, in terms of professional development, because I, I believe, I think we all believe that we have to provide our teachers with the skills to work with English learners, and one of those is how to develop English as a second language. So over the last three years, our teachers have gone through some intensive professional development, if you remember Kate Casella, and we've, in addition, the county office has provided some excellent training for us. And then the second area is that we've been monitoring this implementation, and we do the principals monitor when they visit, also at grade level meetings, and, and department chair meetings talk about how they're implementing the, the professional development training that they've had. Now, the next question, we're going to move into what we call Title III, which is the federal EL program. You know, how, do, how is English language me development measured, the goals, and are we meeting our goals? Being with how does California measure, California measures ELD every year by providing kids a test, the California English Language Development Test, or commonly referred to as the CELT. 
every English learner every year has to take this out. Now this gets extremely difficult at, at the high school level because some of these kids have taken it for 11 or 12 years and they go, not again. And so we have to explain to them, well, you, you pass the test, be re, re, you get reclassified, you don't have to take it. Uh, there are four areas on the test. There's listening, speaking, reading, and writing, and then we get a total score. And there's five levels with it within each of these scores. In terms of what is the state looking for, they're called measurable, annual measurable academic outcomes or AMAOs. <laughs> Once again, I'm trying to give you an idea what it stands for. Uh, so what are they? The first AMAO, M -A -M -A -O one, what the state wants to see is that on the CELT total score, kids are moving up at least one level per year. That's the goal. Currently, we're in the green. We had 70% of our kids achieve the goal. The state, if you look, if I can move this over here, is 60%. So we're outperforming this, the expectations from the state, which is very positive. MAO 2, this is where they, they want students to become what they call proficient on the CELT. This isn't proficient as we would consider proficient overall, but this is proficient on the CELT total score. And what they're looking for is the percent who achieve it less than five years and over five years. And once again, if you look, we're in the green. 31% of our kids achieve proficiency on the CELT at less than five years. The state expects 24%. So once again, we're outperforming the expectation of the state. Five years, is re which is really a realistic timeline. Uh, we have 65%, notice down here, and the state is asking for 50%. So in virtually all three of the areas using the CELT, we outperform what the state is expecting. There's also an AMAO 3, which deals with the state test. But as you well know, they've gone through a major upheaval with the state testing program. And so what the federal government did is they gave us kind of a pass. They, they don't require us to assess us because we don't have anything yet. Now the CASP, the California test that they're currently using, will be the means that they'll be using as, as time goes on and we get a good code. Did you want to? Well, I just wanted to interject. The previous slide that you saw that showed that the, we met the state goals and bettered the, the state goals, that's not typical. Uh, there are a lot of districts that are well below that. Yeah. We should be very proud of our people to, for delivering that. And our children's project. I think that has a big part of this. <clears throat> All right, so let's see what it looks like with charts. Once again, making progress. What's nice here, if I can get my, is not only we're above the line, but we're making good progress. There was a slight dip here, but I think the work we've been doing, is, especially with the younger students, is beginning to pay off here. If we look at less than five years, this is nice. 31% of our kids, nice jump from 23%. So more of our kids are becoming fluent on the CELT in a shorter period of time. If you look at five years, real consistent across the board. And this is what I've seen in my looking at the data over years, is that we get about 65% of our kids reclassified by sixth grade, and then the numbers fall off. Very few kids get reclassified after, after the sixth grade. The, the, for whatever reason, I think it's the difficulty of the test. They just, they shut down. The state is a major problem. They're now calling these students long-term limited English speakers. And in, in, in the United States, we're getting the same issue. They're finding a great number of these kids that just aren't making it, so they call them long-term. It's a new term that's been thrown out the last couple of years. Now, reclassification. Once again, we're trying to get kids reclassified, which means moving them from limited English speaking to fluent English speaking. If you notice, in fact, Dr. Sarvis was asking me about this one. Huge jump, come on, there we go. In 2000, when was that? 2014. 14. You go, wow, what happened? We did an incredible job with these kids. Well, it's not exactly the way it appears. This is the year that they stopped administering the state test. So we lost one of our indicators. We replaced it with the high school exit exam. Now, if you're familiar with the high school exit exam, it's about an eighth grade level proficiency. In addition, 
if you ask the people at the high school, Mr. Kornick was here, how motivated are kids to pass the Casey, the exit exam? Very motivated. Yeah, they, they, if they really want to pass this, the other test, nah, not interested. So it looks good, but the reality is that there's a different criteria. Currently, we have 101 students over here who have met the criteria, but they haven't been reclassified because there's a process that we go through to ensure that they just didn't do well on tests, but they're actually doing well in the classroom. So once again, numbers are going up, which is very positive. And notice, once again, it's an upward trend, which is what we want to see on this. CASP, the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress. This is our second real year of the CASP. We've been in, involved with it three years. This is, this is the second real year of, of data. So what I'm going to do is use the CASP data that's taken right off the uh, California Department of Education website. If you haven't been there, look at it. It's really well done for a change. You can compare schools. You can compare year to year. So some good information. I've just lifted some things for a limited English speaker. I know Dr. Sarvis went over district in general earlier, but we're going to take a look at just the English learners. So if, once again, kind of a review. There are four levels that a student can score, one to four. And I've given you a handout to read because I know you can't <laughs> read this. It would be probably not. But basically, you're looking at exceeding the standard, meeting the standard, nearly meeting it, which means they're close but not quite there, and then completely not making it. Basically, what these are indicators of, are the kids ready for the next year's curriculum is basically what each of those are. They, they're exceedingly ready. They're ready, they're almost ready, or they're not ready at all. And then, so we can begin to take, once again, this is a holistic approach and look at the, the data. What I like about the new test is it breaks it down in what we call claims, or what, what are the individual skills students have to have. And once again, you have this written out, but <clears throat> you, you've got a claim for reading, writing, listening, and, and research and inquiry. And each one has a specific description of what the students have to do. What's nice about this, if a student is weak in reading, this comes out and the teacher knows where to address the, the remediation. So you get your four areas. In math, you have three areas, concepts and procedures. Keep that in mind as we go through because you're going to see that pop up over and over again. Uh, problem solving and lastly, communicating reasoning. Uh, math is, I think, what I've heard the most complaints about or concerns about in terms of teachers and parents understanding what it is kids they're supposed to teach kids. And the students are having difficulty understanding because it's a brand new way of looking at math. It's not just figuring the answer, but it's explaining how you thought got that answer. Are there other alternatives to getting the answer? So it, it's presenting a real interesting challenge, especially for upper grade teachers. Now, I put this up here to show you the number of students. These are limited English-speaking students, so as we go through, you can get a better handle on what the numbers mean. If you notice up here, beginning in sixth grade, we basically get cut in half the number of limited English speakers. The question is why? Because this is when most of our kids get reclassified. So from then on, you see the numbers are not huge. Also, when we talk about these particular grades, understand that these are these are limited English speakers that have not been reclassified. So you would expect their scores to be on the lower end. The students that were doing well over here have already exited out of the program. The other thing I want you to take a look at the language arts scores, 40, 30, 49, that have not met it. Now take a look at math. Huge difference. Mm -hmm. A lot more kids are below in math. And once again, I, I go back. I think it's the new math program and getting kids used to the procedures. It's especially in the upper grades because they haven't had the foundation. Kids starting in K-1-2, they've got, they're getting the foundation. They're going to they're do better than kids in the upper grade that are suddenly thrust into a math program that they're not completely familiar with. Okay, so over time, I, I, what we're going to do is look from third to fourth. This is reading, language arts, which includes reading. What's nice here, look at the number of kids the decrease. Come on, wake up, mouse. Down here, from 51% to 37% not meeting. Very, very nice progress, which is what we would hope because the kids are learning more and more English. And that, of course, is, is, is seen up. Come on, come on. There we go. 
it's also seen here with the increase. And the claim under reading, once again, what do we see? Nice decrease in the number of kids below standard. And a nice movement up to 40, almost 50% of the kids. Come on, wake up, mouse. There we go. Over 50% of the kids either nearly met it or met the standards. So once again, nice progress in reading. We see the same thing in writing. Once again, this is from third to fourth. And we see the same thing in listening. Same thing in inquiry. So in the language arts area, students moving from third to fourth made some real nice progress. Now we get into the area of math. So once again, we're dealing with third to fourth. If you look at this, it's basically pretty flat. Not a whole lot of not improvement or unimprovement. It's basically pretty much the same. A little increase here, but pretty much the same. Now if we go to fourth to fifth, once again, we see some nice improvement in language arts. Bob, I have a question. So, yes. so when, back with the star testing, we used we didn't used to see this this differential. And is this because there's so much more language associated with with math now? My belief is it's a different way of teaching math, different requirements. You don't you don't think it has to do with with so much more writing involved in the math. Math it, it, work. It, it will, but if we're teaching kids language, that shouldn't be an issue. But I think in general, because if you take well, a look, but at remember, I mean, with star testing, it was a, I think it was more pure math, and and you, there, 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 if I remember correctly, there was a much higher uh, level of achievement uh -huh. in Especially in the math with the English learners in the math than there was in the in, in in the language arts. You know, your your language arts scores haven't moved around a whole lot, but. In relation right. to star testing, but the but the the uh, math seems like they're they're it's gone backwards to some degree. Right. And if you remember elementary, under the old test and the star test, our kids were seventy eighth percentile. We don't see that anymore no. because once again the the star test was more solving problems, getting a, coming up with an answer. Two plus two is four. Four plus four is eight. When you get into the the new test, we're dealing with thinking in concepts and understanding application. If you remember in the past years, our, when you moved into algebra, what happened to our scores? They went down. And when you move into algebra, it's more abstract concepts thinking. Versus True, but, but there, there's an awful lot of written mm -hmm. problems now in the math homework and the math school classwork Correct. than there used to be. And, I, and, I, and, and if you, if, so if your language acquisition isn't, isn't Hi. Yeah. Uh, if you're still struggling with 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 the language, mm -hmm. it just seems to me that you're naturally going to struggle with math if 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 it's math is now constant, kind of focused on written questions. And and uh, I think that's what we're seeing here. Yeah. Uh, you'll see as we go into math. Do you remember when we looked at the overall district results? And all of a sudden, we got to fifth grade math, where kids went from operations <laughs> to conceptualization. Well, to get to conceptualization involves a lot more language as well, which is particularly tough for these kids. But uh, across the state, fifth grade math uh, scores r really tanked. And it was more an artifact of, well, I, I thought it was more or an artifact of the test, fifth grade and then sixth grade to some extent as well. And you're just about to see that for our English learners. Yeah. Uh, but the way the state explains it, they said, well, no, we go from operations um, you know, and, and math facts to more conceptualization, and that's tough at this, at this juncture. Well, it would be interesting, and we don't need to go into it now, but I'd like to see the, the relative comparison with with non English learners, okay. with, you know, with the English speaking students, and and see what the math scores yep. have done. Yeah. Everyone did poorly. Everyone's in fifth grade. On, right. Yes. And once again, the the test was developed on using scale scores, which means theoretically we should be able to track a student over time. The star test wasn't developed that way. Each grade was separate, so you couldn't compare third to fourth or fourth to fifth. With scale scores, we can do that. So we shouldn't see this kind of a drop. My thinking, and it would be interesting to get some of the principals thinking on this, 
is we, we're, we're putting kids in situations in the fourth, fifth, sixth grade that they're not ready for. Kids that start K-1-2 with the, the new way of teaching, which is more conceptual, are going to be ready for fifth grade math that's conceptual. When you have students that have gone through a very concrete system and now are suddenly forced to do abstract thinking in the fifth grade, it's like, whoa, I'm not ready for that. But I think over the next couple of years, you're going to see a change in that. Plus, we didn't have a math program last year, a textbook. We do have bridges now, which should provide teachers with a systematic way of teaching math so we, we cover the bases. But as, as, as Brian said, the fifth grade math is not very good. But language arts is. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly. Here's math. Look what happened to math going from fourth to fifth. We go from 33 to 69% of the kids. Remember, these kids haven't been transitioned yet. And then what's nice about the claims is we can go back and take a look at what's causing this, what area are they mo the weakest in. And there it is, concepts and procedures. 80% of our kids failed this particular claim, which is the, the, how well do students use mathematical rules and ideas. If you talk to teachers or students, what's the homework like? It's trying to explain how did you get the answer? Why did you do this? That once again, we want kids to understand the concepts and procedures behind the math so that they're not tied to one particular solution. If we take a look at problem solving, you see the same thing but not as bad. Here's where you have kids. Can they take and show and apply their skills in solving problems? And then lastly, communicating the reason. It still went down, but it's not quite as bad as concepts. Once again, the, and th these are the positives. Language arts, fifth to sixth, nice improvement. Writing, look at the writing. We went from 55% to 33%. So I, and I keep coming back to this idea that in language arts, on the CASP test, our kids are making good progress, which is what you want to see. But in math, it's not as bad. Because now you've got fifth graders who were having difficulty the prior year going into sixth grade, entire levels areas. And once again, where's our area? Where's the problem area? Almost 90% of our kids are having difficulty concepts and procedures. Sixth grade, we see the same same exact pattern: nice improvement in language arts, and in in particular in reading. Look at this: went from 72 to 59, 41. So it's not that the kids aren't learning and making progress. They are in language arts. Writing, look at the writing. Once again, nice progress. But when we get into math, we don't see it. But you notice now you don't see that tremendous drop that we had from fourth to fifth grade. And what's the area of difficulty? Look at this, 95% of our kids. I have been trouble with the, the claim concepts and procedures. And I go back, this is something that kids, it, it takes time to develop this. So you can't throw a student into a new system and expect him to do that well on a test that he's not fully prepared for. Seventh grade, once again, nice improvement. Language arts, of course. When we go to math, or the reading, I'll just hit these real quickly. Come on, go. Ooh. Here we go. Writing, come on, listening, mathematics, what do we see? Same problem. And why? Look familiar, <laughs> concepts and procedures. Communication reasoning. So overall, and, and Dr. Sarvis wanted me to point this out, how do we compare with other districts? What I tried to do here is give you a realistic sample to do a comparison with. So I start on top with the first one is fourth grade. And why did I pick fourth grade? Because fourth grade, the students are still considered English learners. And they would be English learners in virtually every district that, we, that I'm going to be comparing with. We take a look at that, look at our in language arts. We outperform the other two districts. I took uh, Santa Barbara and Ventura. They were nearest by. In math, once again, we did well. This is fourth grade. 
Then I decided, okay, let's compare the entire district. So what I did here is I took all grades, and what do we see if you look at it? At virtually any level, we're just about the same. So I'm take, I hear you looking at all of the LEP kids in the, in the given district, regardless of grade level, and we are consistent and we score about, about the same, whether it be math or language arts as other districts. The nice thing, though, in That's all students, right? It's all students. This is all students. All students. This, once again, which I think is the more powerful thing to look at, is fourth grade when we're looking at English learners that are just moving and, and starting to learn. Our kids are doing better than the neighboring two districts, which is nice to see. Summary, we are exceeding the state standards with the expectation, which is real positive. Uh, meeting the criteria has been increasing reclassification, which is another real positive. We're moving in the right direction. Overall, our kids are moving in language arts, key, moving up from not met to near. But here's our area that we need to continue to work on is mathematics, the claim concepts <coughs> and procedures. So basically, that's a quick and dirty look at where our kids are at. Overall, from my looking at data, the kids are doing well, especially in language acquisition. Math is an area that I think needs to be addressed, and we have the new Bridges program, so that should make a difference. Any questions? Any more information? <laughs> I, I have a question. Yes. So what's going on with the older students who are not classified? Are they speaking their na their native language at home if they're still English learners or are they just not developed their language capabilities? They're just not developing. In fact, a sad commentary is a lot of the students don't speak Spanish anymore. It, that, that, that's uh, I remember when I was at the middle school talking to a student who had gotten into it. He, he was, I can't remember why he was in my office. And the parent was there and I said, explain to your dad, I said this in Spanish, what you've done. And he said, I can't. Mm -hmm. And the dad looked to me in Spanish and said, no, he, d he doesn't speak to me in Spanish anymore. So while they're still considered English learners, their Spanish is, is not there in either. Cases, That's right. interesting. And in fact, which is one of the, the reasons for bilingual education, we're finding the stronger the first language, mm -hmm. in this case it would be Spanish, the better the kids do in English, which mm -hmm. is a, a bigger foundation. But typically it's language arts where our kids have difficulties with the harder the class, the more difficult. And so unless we're providing a really a, a structured program, which is why we are now using the Read 180, that can teach these kids reading skills, They're, they've just been flat for the last umpteen years. Okay? Other questions? I have a question, and maybe this would be directed more towards our principals, but what are we going to do about math? That would and, be directed towards the principles. And the uh, concepts and procedures in particular. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. You're letting me come up. How nice. <laughs> uh, yes, concepts and procedures. And so if you look specifically at those questions on those tests, they are very similar, like Bob said, to the ones that parents might be familiar with coming home. You know, uh, what is the evidence that you use to come up with that answer? Explain your procedures. So it is, as Andy said, very heavy on writing and sentence structure and ability to express yourself in a clear way. Um, and they aren't used to that. If I uh, was in charge of the state of California's education, I would maybe would have considered implementing Common Core in kindergarten and then adding first and then adding second. Yes. Because for a lot of our how kids... How logical. Are, how logical. <laughs> A lot of our kids that are in the secondary system now, whether it be middle school or, or high school, my children included, my own, my personal ones, um, switched halfway through. And right. so it became a different ball game for them, and they didn't have that foundation. I was in a kindergarten class this morning uh, doing an observation, and they are building 10 frames and numbers and being able to look visually at a 10 frame. And how did you know that was seven? Well, because it's five and then two more here at the bottom. So they're being taught in a way that's from the beginning that's going to build that number sense that we haven't been able to do for the kids that were already started. I'm really encouraged that we have bridges uh, for our elementary because ne we haven't had really a curriculum mm -hmm. that's Common Core aligned for <laughs> several years now and we've been pulling from a lot of different sources and luckily we had Christy uh, Guerrero and Clancy leading us through that period of time. But it's certainly not something I'm happy with. I don't think we should accept 
those scores as okay. They are better than other places, but they're not great in my opinion. So there's something we certainly need to work on. Gerardo? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, the, the important thing that we need to remember is just like um, Jamie said, our students switched about three or four years ago, the way they learn and the way they test. Uh, on top of that, um, it's learning the language that mm -hmm. the students are normally not used to. Mm -hmm. So it's heavy on uh, academic language that our students need to learn how to break the sentence, the, the root of the, of the word. And that's something that we've been working on at the high school. Uh, one of the things that we also need to recognize is that um, going back to the question of what happens to the upper level students who are still considered English learners, a lot of them can't function either in one or the other mm -hmm. uh, language. But at the same time, we have students do, that have, are in AP English, who are in an AP math class, who are considered still English learners, mm -hmm. but because they have not consistently met the criteria that we have set as a school district to be reclassified, because they don't take the exam seriously, then as a result, they will always be considered English learners, yet they're going to UC systems, uh, applying to the Cal State system and being um, uh, enrolling in those colleges, but they leave our system still considered to be English learners mm -hmm. because they have not taken those tests seriously. After a while, the CELT, uh, which will be replaced next year, after a while, the CELT test becomes very monotonous. Uh, it's very a basic test. So as a high school student, when you're in 11th grade and they're telling you what's in this, uh, and you describe what's on this picture and you say, well, the mom is telling the student or the child that the ball is on the left side or on the right side, that's where a high school student becomes very, um, um, a test that you would normally take at the, high, at the elementary level. The thing that we have to, uh, at the high school, that we have to uh, remember is that we are only tested uh, for the CASP at the 11th grade. So we need to develop uh, assessments in the ninth and the 10th grade so that we can uh, are able to identify how our students are doing so that we can provide the um, interventions at a timely manner. Uh, just yesterday I met with my math department uh, to ask them to think outside the box. Not wait necessarily for summer school, but perhaps evening uh, interventions where we, uh, if the student just had a test and they failed it, perhaps we can bring them in on Monday or Tuesdays from six to nine. Uh, work with our food services program where we can provide some meals for them uh, and the teachers can reteach what just happened, not wait for summer school. Uh, at the same time, we can also do some front loading. This is going to see for specifically for our English learners. So uh, that was the task that I gave yesterday to my math department to think out of the box to make sure that we can support our students and not necessarily wait till the end of the semester for that F to show up on, the, on, the, on their report card. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You can just say ditto. <laughs> yeah. I, I knew I'd get called up. I knew somebody was going to throw my name out there. <laughs> I agree with my colleagues. Um, they said everything I would have said, um, but just to echo uh, Mr. Cornejo's sentiments, with the, um, the CELT test up till now, making that test relevant is very difficult. I've worked with students in the past who have made that comment, why am I taking this again? Why do I have to do this? Because it's the same test year to year, and it's the same regardless of what level you're on. You're taking the same group mm. test. Um, and so we've had that conversation, and it's great for me to be able to explain to them, if you get a certain score on this, you won't have to take it again. Um, but it's, it's putting it in those words and making it relevant for them. That's important. So I think as we move forward and, and the replacement um, for the CELT comes out next year, that's something we want to make sure that we all understand and we understand the process and, and the reclassification process as it relates to that new assessment because we'll want to make sure that we can then make it relevant to the students, especially at the secondary level. So it's not just a, another <coughs> test they're filling out and churning in, but it's something that they do take seriously, like they used to take the Casey because it was um, whether or not they graduated high school. So um, showing even, even if it, it's simply as much as if you do well in here, you don't have to deal with this again. Unfortunately, that's, that's um, how it was relevant. Uh, up till now with the CELT test. So I think as we move forward to our new assessment, we'll want to figure out how to best communicate to students why it's important um, and why to take it seriously. Any, any other questions on? Uh, no, just a comment. I feel such frustration for students that get caught in the middle of these big changes from the state that um, it, I think it's a true disservice to them. So. Agreed. 
Let me conclude just by mentioning, and it's been mentioned, there will be a new language development test coming out next year is, is piloting it, but there's also a new uh, framework for English language learners, which is more aligned with the language arts framework. So that should provide teachers a little more of a guide in terms of how to best meet the needs of EL students. The current framework that we're being used, I think it's at least eight or nine, ten years old. It, 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 it doesn't even come close to meeting our needs. And of course the CELD is outdated. So look forward to new things coming in language, uh, for English language development. So I, I have one more question. So Gerardo, you mentioned um, some of our board policies are what hold back the reclassification. Is, is there something mm -hmm. that we need to revisit in, in preparation to, to help with this? Well, they're not necessarily board policies. Those are uh, decisions that as a um, leadership team we made a long time ago on what we wanted to our students to demonstrate before they were reclassified so they could be successful when they go into the, re into the mainstream uh, English classes. But when we looked at the high school exit exam, uh, we were the only high school district, high school in the area that was not using the high school exit exam. We were mm -hmm. still using the old uh, CST scores, uh, and we were asking our students who are English learners to perform much better than even the English learners. Mm -hmm. So that's why if you ever look at the results of the, uh, on any test, our FEPS students will always do very well because we've asked them to do, to raise, we raised the bar so high that they outperform a lot of other groups because uh, we've asked them to be advanced or, or proficient in uh, for two or three years in a row. Okay. So as we move forward, the, using the CASP and using uh, at a local level a writing assessment that we've incorporated in the ninth grade for um, as we reclassify the students. Yep. So, That's, and it's you. measuring whether that writing sample is actually measuring something to what we want. So we've done a couple of tweaking over the years. And hopefully this year we'll see some more result, better results in our reclassification of ninth graders. And are you you're working on calibrating that or? Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Move on to E5 and a presentation on this uh, CUSD sixteen seventeen wellness plan. We have uh, Laurel Schwartz here. Welcome. Laura Schwartz is our Director of Nutrition Services. Good evening, everybody. Something totally different here. Um, and speaking of food services, I'm going to be uh, try to be both concise, brief, and thorough because I know most of us are probably looking forward to our dinner. <laughs> um, so I just want to speak for a few minutes. Um, just introduce myself a little bit about my personal background, um, give you a few larger goals that I envision for the food service program and um, just highlight a few um, kind of changes in the health and wellness plan. Um, afterwards, I'll take any questions and comments. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Laurel Schwartz, and um, I actually took on the role of child nutrition and wellness coordinator uh, back in August, so fairly new to the district. Um, I was actually born and raised in Ventura County. Um, I did my master's in education at UCSB, class of 2010, mm -hmm. and um, what I studied during my master's uh, program was actually school garden initiatives and learning outcomes. Um, and so when this opportunity came up, I just had to take it. Um, I did my registered dietitian in 2012. When I completed my internship, I actually worked in hospital food service, so I'm coming to this position with lots of different experience, both kind of business, nutritional science, a uh, little bit of education background. So I'm hoping to just really make some positive um, improvements in our community and our district. Um, so that being said, um, here are a few notes on my larger goals. Firstly, um, I want to increase visibility and support of our food service program um, in conjunction with the supplemental programs we are already uh, working with, uh, including our Explore Ecology Garden Program, which I saw was on the agenda. Um, I would like our program to become priority as part of the total classroom experience. And I personally believe that our food service program should model the kind of behaviors that we'd like to see community-wide. Um, I will continue to support our kitchen staff in terms of um, having them have autonomy to make the best decisions for their sites. 
um, kind of pushing continuing education and staff development. And I'll also be using effective measures to reduce overspending. Um, examples of that are, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, effective bidding and incorporation of government commodities, use of local fresh produce, and increase of sustainable practices um, such as moving towards compostable, um, you know, dishware and such. Um, so our wellness plan is actually a uh, government mandated document that will be publicly available as you all know. I really think that the document provides a base for us to kind of structure some of these larger goals. Um, so in terms of the plan itself, I just wanted to give a few, um, highlight a few items in the plan. So the 2016-17 version of the wellness plan, um, first of all, it's been edited for length. So um, this is compared to the plan that I inherited from last year. Um, sections were condensed, um, just using more clear and concise language, um, resulting in a more compact document. I'm sure you guys will thank me for that. Um, so now it is 12 pages instead of the 25 that it was, which is an improvement. Um, so. What I plan to do is really take over the district wellness committee and engage members to be active in terms of planning the um, goals for our wellness plan. And you'll see the addendum, um, which I believe is on page 12. And what that is is basically a list of items that were brought up, uh, topics for discussion from last year that I'd like to address um, with the wellness committee and, of course, um, share with the board during the 2016-17 school year. Um, and I think that we can plan for next year, this year, and kind of keep that going. Um, the wellness plan contains important information regarding physical education minimums and opportunities for more movement throughout the day. Um, these guidelines have been adopted from our previous plan, but yet are important to note. Um, Fundraising is also mentioned in the plan. Uh, it is important to support our district fundraising causes while at the same time encouraging families and staff to make choices that are in line with our wellness plan. Uh, for example, for celebrations in the classrooms, uh, we have prohibited baked sugary goods such as cupcakes or cookies. Um, and we want to encourage use of non-food rewards, um, especially in the classroom. I think this is a concern that's been kind of brought up the stereotypical, you know, mom baking the cookies and bringing them, and it's like every celebration becomes about cupcakes. And so we're doing a good job at already kind of nipping that in the bud. Um, nutritional guidelines are also included. Um, so a lot of these are government mandated, as you know, but we're doing a really great job of meeting or exceeding minimum nutritional requirements, uh, RDA set by the government. Um, for example, our, gov our uh, cafeterias are already using a lot of fresh preparation methods, uh, fresh fruit offerings, local uh, fruit, low amounts of individually packaged foods, uh, low fat dairy, low to no sodium ingredients, and no deep frying. Sugary beverages is another thing that has been in the media. Um, and I think that it is important to phase those out and completely reduce them. Our wellness plan actually states that um, all juices available for sale um, or through the cafeteria must be 50% uh, fruit juice and have no added caloric sweeteners. And we've uh, prohibited carbonated sodas on campus. Uh, the plan also outlines community use of school facilities, including kitchens. Um, and I'd like to kind of continue to work with the individual site supervisors um, to, to kind of determine what's best for their sites. Um, lastly, monitoring and policy review are mentioned. So, my goal is to really inspire our community to engage in our wellness policy and contribute throughout the year so that we can just continue to refine it and, and make it better. Um, so with that being said, um, I wanted to submit the wellness plan to the board for approval. And I want to thank you for taking the time to review it. And I thank the community for supporting our shared vision of wellness. Um, I will do my best to answer any questions at this point. I'd just like to thank you for making it more concise yeah. well, and shorter. <laughs> nice. Much easier to read. Yeah. And, and it's still all there. It is. Yeah. It's yeah. still all there. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Comments? No, just I'm just looking at your topics for this year too yes. and, and they're really neat. I 
I really like them. So yeah, thank you. Um, Sue Harrison was really instrumental in helping me to put together that list of topics. I obviously came in at the beginning of the school year, um, and I think this is really important because we can put those items on the addendum and keep cycling through. It's it's really important to kind of address issues as they come up and not let the wellness plan be just a stagnant document, but more of a living, living, breathing document. Great. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, it is. Okay. So can I get a motion to um, approve or a motion? I move we accept the um, wellness plan for 2016-2017 as presented. I second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item E6, and we have Dr. Maria Fisk here to dis talk to us about CARP Children's Project. Thank you. As you know, the, the progress toward independence on the part of the Children's Project is continuing to move forward. You've seen MOUs, you'll see more of them, and Maria Fisk is the Carpinteria Children's Project Director. Yes. Get all set up. Okay. I can always talk more. <laughs> I use that to advance. Okay, great. Thank you very much for having me uh, tonight to speak with you. Just a quick summary about who we are at the Carpinteria Children's Project. Um, we engage in three interrelated categories of work. Uh, one is direct service for family support and parent classes, primarily through our Family Resource Center. Direct services in early childhood education. We have over 100, 100 children enrolled in our six classrooms right now and our TK and K after school programs at Aliso and Canalino. We offer child care during parent classes and Safety Town Camp in the summer. And a third category of work is collective impact network coordination. You'll hear a little bit more about that uh, tonight. As you already know, we work with about 14 partners, mostly on site, some off site, who are government agencies or other nonprofit organizations uh, in the community who serve families in Carpentria. Our vision, and this was written over the years by uh, Michelle and others who were engaged in the community-wide effort to sort of define the Carpinteria project um, and the Thrive Carpinteria mission and vision. So these words have, have been around. Um, the Carpinteria Children's Project envisions a community where children and families are engaged, equipped, and empowered in positively shaping the future. Our mission is to build a culture of success through community partnerships where all children are successful cradle to career. And I thought I would highlight a couple of our new classes that we have uh, this fall that, that really demonstrate the strength of those um, community partnerships. So we're offering a beginning Spanish class for adults. Uh, and that is very well enrolled. Uh, we have some teachers in the K-12 system who are enrolled, some folks from CCP and some uh, parents as well. Uh, we've uh, contracted, you approved a contract with a teacher from City College who's providing that class. Uh, we saw a little uptick in folks coming into the Family Resource Center with domestic violence uh, concerns and issues that they were dealing with. So we've brought in the Domestic Violence um, Solutions Group and they are offering a support group. And I'm very pleased to say that it's being attended. That really is an accomplishment in and of itself. That's a, a difficult problem to grapple with and we're really pleased that we can provide a home for um, some folks who are uh, dealing with those issues. Uh, the Fathers Group offered by Calm is back. The funding is back. Um, Family Service Agency is offering a new class through a federal grant that they got a Healthy Relationship for Couples grant, uh, um, couples class that we're excited about. Our Healthy Cooking class is underway now. There are two more classes. This is a bilingual class, so Wednesdays uh, tomorrow, 4 to 6, if you're interested, come on over to the auditorium and join in. And we also have a women's support group that's being organized by our volunteer promotoras, and they're bringing in guest speakers weekly on Monday mornings. And we're particularly proud of 
the promotors and the work that um, they have done and pleased that they're pursuing their interests and sharing them with the community and things that they think we could learn more about. So we're all about systems change. Um, children are only as strong as the families in which they live and families are only as strong in the communities in which they reside. So we work at all those levels. And these two are words that have been with us uh, for quite some time since the beginning of the project. We are very pleased to be showing count data, which I know out in the research world is sort of thought of as low-level data, but when you're trying to work with this many partners to bring them all together, we are proud of our count data. <laughs> and we are in our second year of uh, collecting this kind of data, so we'll begin to be able to look at trends um, over time. But if you look, and this is just health and social services, we're not looking at our early childhood education partners, but in health and social services, um, I know it's, it's hard to read, but you can see on the left there that that bar that everybody is right around is uh, 500. So there are 500 families every month that across all the partners um, are being served. So um, those partners are behavioral, county <coughs> behavioral wellness, WIC, the Family Resource Center, the Department of Social Services, Family Service Agency, CALM, Santa Barbara um, Community College, English as a Second Language, um, uh, maternal Child Adolescent Health, which they provide home visiting in the community, uh, and the County Supervisor's Office. And how many are seen every month? If you look on the right, you can see that we see around 300 families across the group um, every month. Now, there could be some duplication in that. Our systems are not sophisticated enough yet. Give us a few more years, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to know which of those are seeing more than one partner. Um, but certainly, we know that um, you know we got a whole bunch so we're feeling really good knowing that we've got a broad reach into, into the community. Our kindergarten readiness scores have just come in. Thanks very much to the kindergarten teachers who uh, have uh, completed the um, KSEP, which is the kindergarten student entrance <laughs> profile uh, for all of the children, including our special education children um, in the Carpinteria Unified School District. And as you can see, our ready to go scores have gone up a little bit this year. Certainly we can see over time, that's looking like an up upward uh, trend. And we certainly hope, you know, one year uptick is not enough to really show that we're jumping up again, but um, we're certainly hoping that that is the case. Uh, our overall percentage of children who are ready to go and almost ready to go, that green line, is holding pretty steady, but the fact that of those, you know, more are ready to go is, is exciting. <laughs> so we are um, going smoothly in our transition to the nonprofit. All of the funders are pleased. All of them have been very engaged in this process, as has uh, the school district board, as have the, all of you and administrators as well. Um, grants have started going to the nonprofit, and that will be fully done um, by January. Contracts will need to move kind of at the last minute. Grants, we could start transitioning a little bit earlier, most of them. Um, as uh, Dr. Sarvis mentioned, you're seeing MOUs and uh, subcontracts, and we're not quite done, but we're, we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there, moving through this. And we really do see this as a win-win, and I know from conversations that you all do too, that this is, um, we'll continue a very strong partnership with the district, um, but uh, as CCP begins to operate as a nonprofit, which will be fully effective January 1, it increases our ability to fundraise. Uh, foundations are used to giving to nonprofits, um, and that sort of outreach is something we can do a little more effectively as a nonprofit, <laughs> simply put, and it gives us some um, increased flexibility in sort of our business practices and our programs. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention here is that a few of us met last spring talking about a retrospective study of kind of the ripple effects of, of bringing Thrive Carpenteria and the Carpenteria Children's Project into the community. 
uh, in 2008-2009. Um, that project will be funded by the Bauer Foundation and we are moving forward so I anticipate probably December will really get rolling and it'll take us several months but I look forward in the spring to sharing uh, some findings from that study with the board. Okay, I thought I would share with you um, our actual expenses. Um, thank you, Maureen, for your help with this <laughs> and uh, providing this chart. Um, we did better than we expected um, by the end of the year. That is in, in large part because we received about $100,000 in grants that we did not know that we were going to have at the beginning of the year. So, um, you know, frankly, that helps a whole lot. <laughs> that helps a whole lot. Um, also, to give us more breathing room, we did not replace the family liaison who resigned in uh, February, and that resulted in, you know, lower staff and benefits costs than we had uh, projected. Um, we also have not replaced the Early Childhood Education Services Director who resigned in July. These gaps do need to be filled. These are not long-term solutions, and we are working towards... Uh, closing those those gaps in personnel. This is our budget for this year. This is split, you know, the school district and the nonprofit, but sort of looking as a at a at it as a whole. Um, I am hopeful what you see at the bottom if you just cut to the chase is a fifty thousand dollar operating loss over this school year, but because we have some money in reserves being okay, um, I'm optimistic that we will not have that um, $50,000 operating loss. We are actually in talks with the funder who we, are, we have a site visit in a couple of weeks, and there may be some other possibilities for grants that will come in this year to help us. But wanting to be um, cautious rather than optimistic when we're, <laughs> when we're looking at um, when we're looking at uh, a budgeting. So overall, I just want to thank you so much for your support and the ways in which we have been thinking together like a system. How do we best work together so that we can help all our kids be ready for kindergarten and ready for success cradle to career? And I'm just so pleased that we're at this point. The Carpentria Children's Project would not be where it is, obviously, without the support and stewardship of the school district. And we're always going to be a part, even if our business relationship has changed. So thank you. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. Uh, no, I just, I, go ahead. I, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm sure your funders are very encouraged by, I know they like data and they like <laughs> numbers. Um, and, see, and to see the, 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 the results of, of all their efforts. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's great to see that, that that upward trend in, in kindergarten readiness and and uh, um, you know I, I expect that will continue. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful to think about the impact that's having on our forward. students, our future students, our current students moving forward, and our teachers as well, yeah. our yeah. staff. And I know I shared with you in some previous presentation that based on data Matt Cork from UCSB has done in comparing the different communities that give the KSEP, it's hard to be ready to go in Carpinteria. You know, it's harder to get that score here than it is in some others. At least the evidence suggests that because our kids who score that ready to go, when we look at their performance in second and third grade, they're still doing great. Yeah. So it seems to really stick. Yep. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, move on to public comment. Uh, the agenda. Do we have comment? We do. The first speaker is Maureen Claffey. She has stage fright, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maisie really wanted to come to the meeting yes. tonight, so I promised her she could come. So, um, hi, I'm Maureen Claffey, um, and first of all, um, thank you. I haven't had a chance to come here and say formally say thank you for extending the TK program. Um, Maisie, what do you think of TK? Good. Do you like it? Yeah. 
Um, so we really, really appreciate the, that you guys reconsidered that choice. And um, I've heard back from a lot of moms and families, and they're just delighted to have <coughs> their kids in that program. Um, the other thing is, I'll mention it since Dr. Fisk was just talking, um, Maisie went to Children's Project, and the program ha is a lifesaver for so many families, um, all the programs, but especially the early childhood. And the good news is when we started, um, it was, uh, it was, there was not as many families interested in it. Like it was easy to get in, and now it's really hard to get in, which is good, because it means that the program is, you know, whatever, gaining traction, and maybe they can expand it more too. So um, the last point I want to make, though, is about the bus drivers. That's what brought, um, caught my eye on the agenda tonight. Um, I am really passionate about um, trying to keep those bus drivers um, employees of the district and not move to a sort of contracting situation with Santa Barbara Transportation. Um, Jack is Maisie's bus driver. He picks her up every morning at 7.15, and we have a great relationship with him. My mom worked with him as a teacher. We just really, really value his years of employment. Jose, I don't know if any of you realize it, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but the other bus driver, Jose, had to work on a day when his wife had major surgery, the first day of school, because there were no subs for him. And I don't think that's right. I don't think we would want that. Um, a bus driver at the starting salary that we're offering, $13 an hour, gets paid about $540 a week. That's, that's less than we're paying Mr. Sarvis for one sub day of his time. So um, I think we just need to look at these priorities. I, I saw that Wendy is leaving the transportation manager. I don't know how to replace her or how to get that fully staffed, but it's such a critical safety piece. If Maisie had a medical emergency on the bus on her way to school, um, there's no one that I can call right now to find out or, or if I needed to contact her, and that's really scary as the mom of a four and a half year old. So um, I don't know what to do. I know there's a shortage statewide, but maybe we could offer a signing bonus, a one-time signing bonus, or pay to, to, to train that bus driver. Um, anyways, that's, I'm, I just hope that they can find a solution for that and keep those USD employees, you know, part of the district. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Rogelio Delgado. Uh, thank you. And basically, this is an Amber Alert math. You just cannot accept those math results. Never. Never. When I was a teacher, and some of my students would fail a test. They weren't responsible. It was me. And I have taught at every level, elementary, middle school, high school, college. And it doesn't matter. Math is a universal language. So it doesn't matter if you don't speak the language. You should be able to speak do well in math. And uh, yes, I agree with uh, Gerardo that you, everybody has to think outside the box. We cannot just go on one line. No, you have to think to the left. You have to think to the right. Probably talking, I would, well, this is what I would do. And it, what happened to me, I mean, that was a long time ago. And 20% uh, of my students were failing. And the principal called me up and said, Rogelio, it's not the students, it's you. you. Better look for a way for those students to improve their scores. And it was 20, 25 years ago. And Right now, I just cannot say I, can, I cannot accept those results. So we have to, all of us, teachers at every level, principals, school board members. Uh, I think it would be a good idea to show up daytime, see how the teachers are 
teaching the subject, see how the students are learning the subject. In this case, it's math, math. And I hope that uh, this math results improve because I just cannot accept the results right now. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is Gary Blair. Oh, whoops, this is on item E5. Right now, begin. <laughs> this is about the wellness program, uh, board members. Uh, good evening. Uh, just wanted to relate to your experience that we had yesterday. Our <coughs> uh, us three candidates for the board were invited to uh, come and do a reading to the Girls Inc. Uh, girls, and it was really fun because first hour or so was to the first through fourth and fifth graders, and we got some great questions, but. At the end, they, they brought us together in the gymnasium to address the, uh, the older kids from eighth grade to into high school. And, and I think we have three or four, and I'd like them to just stand up and be recognized because they're, they're committed and engaged by showing their interest in what goes on at the board. Thank you, ladies, for being here. Yeah. Um, I know it's a long night. But when we broke up into the groups um, at the end, they had six questions that they addressed to us, and they were very intelligent questions. In fact, maybe even better questions than we had at the candidates forum <laughs> a week ago. <laughs> but one of the questions that they had uh, came at the end, and it was, how can our school lunches be improved? <laughs> and so I was very happy when I saw that you've just hired Laurel Schwartz as your new child nutrition and wellness coordinator, because that, that is an area that can, you know, can stand a lot of improvement. One of the examples is that, you know, we give out too much pizza. It's carbohydrates, you know, the body converts carbs into sugars. Sugars are not good. And I liked what I heard from Laurel that we're not doing carbonated drinks. We're not giving the kids, uh, you know, drinks with sugars. If it's fruit juice, it's gonna be at least 50% fruit. But I would like to really see this program um, lifted up and make improvements quicker than, you know, in a year. And I, I would hope, I don't know what the committee membership is going to be or what it is now, but it would be really nice if we had a student representative on the committee because they will tell you <laughs> what they like and what they don't like. Mm -hmm. And our goal, of course, is to give them something that's nutritious, but something that they'll eat at the same time. So I'm, I'm just here to support that and to advocate that you're doing a good thing by you know, having this program in place and please include the students. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Gary. I'm, I apologize for not include, having your comments heard uh, when we were discussing the item, but um, I'm glad we all agree. <laughs> and I, 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 I just echo your comment. I mean, I think that's a really great idea to include a student there. Okay. Um, we'll move on to uh, board policies and the uh, first reading of administrative regulation. 1330 community relations use of school facilities can I get a motion there I'll move for approval of administration regulation 1330 second any discussion I, I'm just gonna assume too this this is put on because of the use of Maine is that part of what this is just a change in so yeah. it's a legislation alcohol. change? Yeah. Okay. Use of alcohol. On school sites. Oh, I was just looking at the use of school facilities for child mm -hmm. care centers, but mm -hmm. okay. No, so it was primarily because of that change in being able to, to provide alcohol when students aren't present for yeah. some other activity. <laughs> when students aren't present. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This, yeah. this it, it makes uh, high school auditorium that much more Fun? practical it does because <laughs> yeah. we can get some, fundraisers. Get, some, get some fundraisers going there now yeah that's true um okay all in favor of the first reading uh, uh, aye all right uh move on to h uh business operations facilities and warrants i move we approve the warrants for october 1st 2016 through october 15th 2016 
in the amount of one million three hundred sixty-five thousand five hundred and twenty-eight dollars and ninety-four cents. No second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, move on to Measure U. Uh, first item is acceptance of a completed contract for Carpenter High School Classrooms Wing C and G roof replacement with Craig Roof Company. The original amount was for $499,120. And the completed construction contact, contract amount with, I think, one change order was uh, for $503,912. dollars $503, um, That's good. I get a motion there. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, item I-2, approval of uh, change order number one, ADA improvements, uh, walkway replacements, phase one at Carpenter High School. Um, the change order is in the amount of $53,726 with Shaw Contracting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, move on to item J, personnel. And the uh, this is for the approval of AB 1200, disclosure of proposed collective bargaining agreement uh, between cause and CUSD. Good. Uh, we have a r report on this item. This is uh, dealing with AB 1200. Uh, we're pleased to have a tentative agreement with the bargaining unit regarding salary and contract issues. Before we consider the agreement, uh, we need to know what the effect of the financial part of the agreement is on us. AB 1200 requires the district to submit the compensation numbers to the county education office to ensure that they will pencil out over successive years. So this is sort of, sort of a check in this uh, AB 1200 disclosure uh, so that the county office can be sure that districts aren't running themselves into bankruptcy. And that has happened across the state in other cases. To reach this agreement, the district and the bargaining unit went through fact-finding and subsequent negotiations. The board had it right all along. You knew what the budget could bear and what the budget uh, could not. The money that you put on the table in April during 2015-16 last year, uh, by this agreement, that money was spread over a three-year period Ongoing, what are now assured salary increases by this agreement will provide a 1% increase starting April uh, at the end of last year, a 2% increase starting April at the end of this year, and a 1% increase in April at, toward the end of this following year. Last year's budget per, uh, is closed, so we're really done with last year's budget. The cost of the increase last year and the increase that will take effect this April uh, are both borne by this year's budget. And by backloading the money you offered last April so that most of the costs are brought to bear, not even in this year's budget, by next year's budget, because as you'll recall in April, you were expecting to spend that money last year. That does two things. First, it allows the district to maintain a reserve near the target 10%. Second, it gives the district time to adjust programs and pay for the ongoing increases of 1%, 2%, 1% going into the following year. And those will carry through into then 2018, 2019. Adjustments we will need to make so that we can continue to maintain that 10% reserve. Obviously, any savings to the budget that can be made now will help to reduce costs required in the future. In addition to these assured ongoing salary increases of 1%, 2%, and 1%, there's contingency language so that if property tax revenue increases significantly beyond the level anticipated when the budget was built last year, 
then additional ongoing salary increases will be provided. Our CBO, Maureen Fitzgerald, will describe the AB 1200 disclosure. So you have a, <clears throat> excuse me, you have a copy of the disclosure. It's quite lengthy, and basically what it's doing is exactly what Dr. Sarvis said. It's loading in the 16, 17, 17, 18, and 18, 19 year the costs of all of those um, settlement agreements and assuring to the county, because this is a three-year certification, um, not only with, a, with the tentative agreement being 15, 16 through 17, 18, but we have to show the 16, 17 through 18, 19 solvency. And so the agreement's making sure that and Brian and I have to sign the document that, yes, in the term of that period of three years, we can afford this agreement. Um, I, have, um, I have gone over it with the county um, just yesterday, so they just got to responding to, the doc to this document. There was a lot of clarifying, since this is a complicated agreement. Um, and they also had <clears throat> uh, just a note um, on property taxes and the auditor's tax bill that has been sent out and the amount that they're anticipating to collect for us versus the, re the real taxes collected in May, um, <clears throat> as well as, so, you know, coming up with the conservative approach to not over-project what that may be because it could come in lower. On the other hand, there could be a big sell or there could be um, some... Um, other circumstances that create more taxes for us. So it's making sure that we're being um, aware of what the contingency language will do if it's triggered and then not over projecting um, based on the auditor's actual tax bill. Um, I think that there's not much in the agreement that we probably haven't shared already in our multi-years. It's just formalizing the documents that they require. I will say that one of the things in this document <clears throat> that, um, uh, and it's, uh, there's not a page on here, but it's the, the page that you sign that basically says, are there going to be budget adjustments necessary to make this agreement? And the comments in this document are that it's, it's the intent that budget reductions are explored to restore fund balance and to mitigate our negative deficit spending, but for this agreement, they are not required. Mm -hmm. So in the three years, we have our full 3%. However, the board does have in its policy a, a, a desire to have 10. So we need to have that discussion, and we did through the budget study session to continue that conversation on how we restore the, the fund balance and get that deficit mitigated. All right. That's it. Unless you want to go through the papers. I no, mean, no, no, say, no, 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 no. <laughs> I think we've done that enough. Next time. <laughs> on a motion. <laughs> yes, I would like a, uh Well, actually, is this, yes, this is a money motion to, yes, to accept we, this? Yes, we would like you to approve the disclosure. Yeah. I, I move for approval of the AB 1200 <clears throat> disclosure. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Move on to J2, which is the uh, contract agreement with, uh, certificated and classified employees represented by the uh, Carbony Association of Unified School Employees. This is the actual agreement reached in mediation following fact-finding between our bargaining unit and the school district. And while I just talked about elements of it as part of the uh, AB 1200 disclosure, I think it bears repeating so that we're very clear about what this agreement is. This is an agreement for both certificated and classified employees that are represented by cause, the bargaining unit. Compensation includes 1% ongoing salary increase beginning April 2016, 2% ongoing salary increase beginning April 2017, that's toward the end of this year, and a 1% ongoing salary increase beginning April 2018. Additional ongoing salary increases will be provided if property taxes received by the district exceed the current property tax revenue baseline by a significant amount during the 2016-17 school year 
or during the 2016 uh, during the 2017-18 school year. That's next year. Additional longevity increases will be provided for certificated employees who have worked in the district for 25 years and for 30 years beyond the longevity increases they already receive. Other contract articles. Contract articles in other areas are also included in the agreement dealing with mediating grievances, extending parental leave from six weeks to 12 weeks, consistent with new state legislation, safety articles for both certificated and classified employees, classified work hours, and an evaluation form to be used in evaluating counselors. The agreement concludes negotiations for last year, this year, next year. Uh, that's right up through 2017-18. Although the two parties may reopen articles during our next school year by mutual agreement. The board has been notified that the agreement has been ratified by the bargaining unit and has the tentative agreement on the agenda tonight for your approval. Okay. Can I get a motion there? I move that we approve the contract agreement with certificated and classified employees. I second that. Any discussion? I do. I have a, pre a prepared thing to, to read. Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank um, Dr. Sarvis, Darlene, Maureen, and Jamie, who's, who's left, for um, spending the many, many hours during the fact-finding um, process. Um, they were still there at 3 o'clock in the morning the following day, and uh, we really appreciate your endurance and um, <laughs> willingness to go through that process. Um, so I just also wanted to take the opportunity to comment on the recent tentative agreement reached between CAUSE and the district. Um, I've been on the board now for two years, and even though my profession is in education, I've learned more about school governance and the inner workings of public education uh, during this short tenure than I have in the full 26 years that I've been an educator. Um, in particular, the last year and a half um, has been filled with struggle and contention between the district and cause over interpretations of budget and di direction for the district. While it was never the intent to involve the public in these struggles, unfortunately there were students, families, and community members that were forced to take sides. And as a board of trustees, um, I'm sure all of us regret that occurrence. Mm -hmm. And although everyone on each side had the best of intentions, um, all of us could have done a better job of communicating in respectful and empathetic ways that could have modeled civility and maturity for our students. Uh, with that said, I am happy that we have reached an agreement that will last through 2017-2018. Uh, this pause in negotiations will give the board and cause a chance to build trust and work to find common ground by which to move forward in future years. I hope that both sides can take this time to reflect, learn more about the other, and remember that each and every one of us is doing what we do for the children and families of this community. We can all work off the guiding assumption that we want the best for our children and want Carpinteria Unified School District to be strong fiscally, programmatically, and still support our human capital, which is our teachers and staff. So, thank you. Very nice. Well, thank well you, said, Michelle. Michelle. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move on to item J3, which is the application of terms of tentative agreement reached in mediation following fact finding between cause certificated, cause classified at NCUSD to the following underrepresented, unrepresented, <laughs> unrepresented employees certificated administrators, classified management, classified supervisors, and classified confidential employees. So, can I get a motion there? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, move on to item J4, which is uh, a resolution 
uh, resolution 16-792, which is a classified employee layoff resolution um, as it pertains to the Carpenter Children's Project uh, um, as they transition to a uh, private uh, organization. Uh, can I get a motion for that resolution? Move for approval of resolution 16 792. Second. This is a roll call. Alicia? Aye. Jacqueline? Aye. Andy? Aye. Terry? Aye. And I'm I. All right. Move on to board communications. Alicia? Uh, no, just hope that everyone has a safe um, Halloween and watch out for all the kids out there. Um, just a reminder to go out and vote. Mm. Go vote. Mm. All right. <laughs> Michelle? I do. I have another written thing. All right. So it's, I, I was on a roll. <laughs> you are on a roll. Yeah. Um, okay, so earlier this year, um, one of our longtime teachers quietly retired, and she was not publicly acknowledged for her years of service, so I'd like to do that now. Um, at the time of her retirement, um, teacher Barbara Riggs, um, uh, completed in October her 19th year of teaching with us. She started her career uh, with three years at Catalino and another 16 years at Aliso, where she taught kindergarten. She faithfully served our district um, from 1997 to 2016, and during that time touched the lives of hundreds of children, thus helping to form the Carpinteria that we know today. In the professional sense, Barbara was dedicated, compassionate, and had high standards for her students. And in a personal sense, Barbara is one of the most kind and approachable um, people I have ever met. Her smile and welcoming nature made each and every student in her class feel at home. She believed and demonstrated that every child, no matter their circumstances, could succeed and the legacy she leaves of building a strong early foundation for academic success and her students will endure for years to come. I would like to thank Barbara publicly for her service and let her know that her efforts were noticed, appreciated, and she is an example of all that is good in Carpinteria School District. So. Very, Very nice. nice. Very so, awesome. Yes. And having children who've gone through her classroom, I'll completely echo those sentiments. She mm -hmm. is a tremendous person and teacher. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Terry? I don't have anything tonight. Okay. All right. Huh? Do you have anything? I do not. <laughs> but I <must>. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, we'll uh, we're adjourned. Thank you, thank everyone. You.